Okay, it's a little uh, after six, about six minutes after the hour. So I also want to be respectful of everyone's time. So we'll get started with just introductions and hopefully we'll we'll get some more folks to join us before we get into the substance of the meeting. So I'll, I'll start. My name is Latoya Whiteside. I'm a senior attorney and also the director of the Race Equity and Corrections Initiative at Prisoner Legal Services. Matt. Uh, my name is Matt Hudson. I'm the community liaison slash paralegal for the REICI. Hi, my name is Ariana and I'm a paralegal with the REICI team. Hi, my name is Kelsey Goodrow. I'm a paralegal and project coordinator for the REICI team. Amanda. Amanda, if you'd like to introduce yourself. Yeah, thank you. I lost sound because of my music situation. Um, hi, my name is Amanda Napier, and I've been doing some volunteer coalition building with REICI. Good to see everyone tonight. It's great to see so many wonderful names. I can't say faces, but <laughs> we see a lot of names uh, logged in. So thank you, everyone, for taking the time out of your busy schedules and uh, your evenings, uh, certainly appreciate it because I know after a long, hard day's work, the last thing we really want to do is continue. So um, thank you very much for giving us this time and allowing us to share uh, some very important information with you. Um, I would just like to go over briefly, um, if you're not familiar with our organization or the work that we do, just want to talk briefly about what it is that that, that we do on a regular. Um, so uh, the Race Equity and Corrections Initiative, which is also referred to as REICI or Reiki, um, is a program within prisoner legal services. Our mission is primarily to focus on combating the day-to-day -day, uh, desperate impact and treatment of Black and Brown prisoners uh, housed throughout Massachusetts. Um, we uh, essentially started doing that work, recognizing that there's a lack of data which would allow us to uh, substantively challenge structural racism in corrections. And so we set out to collect a lot of that information through surveys. Um, I was also involved with the uh, Structural Racism in Corrections uh, Commission, which was a legislative body and uh, another issue that uh, we came across um, in doing that charge was the lack of race data. And so from that stemmed legislation that uh, essentially is, is the reason why we're here to help support that cause and to push that initiative, but it's to help facilitate the recommendations of that of that body, um, which essentially is to mandate the, co the collection of uh, racial demographics within the Department of Corrections, as well as the House of Corrections. Um, and this information is uh, includes information such as um, disciplinary proceedings, uh, medical care, uh, mental health care, um, access to employment, access to housing, um, anything really pertaining to the day-to-day -day operations of corrections is not currently information that is being aggregated by race. And so the bill would help to uh, push that initiative as well as to begin to set minimum standards for um, uh, anti-racism uh, within corrections. So that's essentially what uh, REICI does and what um, the bill would set out to do. We also have a project that I wanted to briefly mention. It's called the Prisoner Empowerment Project. Um, I think that this is a very innovative project and hopefully something that other organizations may one day take on. Um, essentially, the idea is to compensate individuals who are currently incarcerated um, without their support, without their assistance, without their reporting. Uh, essentially, organizations like PLS would not exist. Um, a lot of the information that we do receive is based on information that's shared directly from prisoners. And so we wanted to find a way to um, not only show our appreciation, but also to recognize the fact that there's value in, in their contributions and there's value in their expertise and the information that they can provide. And so we are working with them. Uh, they're essentially, they essentially work as volunteers. Um, but we do provide a stipend for the support that they provide. 
Um, it's also a way to help combat and address issues within the Department of Corrections and their failure to uh, pay uh, comparable wages for the work that prisoners do. So um, it's kind of a killing two, burn, two birds with one stone effort um, and something that uh, REICI has continued to push even outside of PLS. We, we make it a point to raise funds so that we can continue um, this effort and continue to uh, provide those donations for prisoners. So hopefully maybe another organization would either choose to donate to, to our cause or um, likely to also uh, replicate the project. So I just wanted to put that out there. And now I will turn it over to Amanda to uh, give you a little more information about uh, why we're here today. You're on mute, Amanda. You're on mute. Thank you. <laughs> Host the tech problems. Hopefully they're all front front loaded in, in my little snafus. Um, so I just want to say thank you to a few organizations that sent out the flyer about this evening that helped bring many of you here this evening, for those of you who were not already aware of this effort. So I just want to say um, thank you to the Social Justice Committee of First Parish Unitarian Universalist Church in Bridgewater, Deeper Than Water, Catholic Charities Brockton, uh, Rotary Club of the Bridgewaters, and Bridgewater Communities for Civil Rights. Um, additionally, some organizations have already been, uh, individuals have already been making calls uh, for, for a bill that we'll be talking more about. Um, so mm -hmm. thank you to people from Bridgewater Communities for Civil Rights and also uh, Surge showing up for racial justice um, for, uh, for uh, really, really building this movement with us. And I also want to uh, make sure that we thank uh, our legislators. I see um, Representative Idahoven is on with us. So thank you so much, Rep, for, for um, taking the time out to join our meeting today. Thank you all um, so, so much for gonna... having me. That's all. <laughs> thank you. <laughs> So we're also just gonna give a little bit of information about our call to action and then we'll get started. Great, thank you. Um, yeah, so I'm gonna drop um, for, I'm gonna drop two things into the chat um, so that you just have this information in case anyone has to scooch out early, but I'll, uh, I'll unpack some of this a little more later. So the first thing I'm dropping into the chat is a toolkit. Um, no, that was to waiting room, meeting group chat. There we go. Ha ha, there it is. You see before you a, a Google Doc, and you'll find there a few um, a few different actions you can take. I'll talk more about that later. And then I'm also shortly going to drop into the chat um, uh, three email addresses and the body of an email. And this will go to Senator Walter Timelty um, so that he knows that everyone here supports this bill so that we can get it reported out of committee ASAP. So I'm going to drop that into the text. And again, I'll speak more about all of those things later on in this meeting. Now I'll turn it over to Matt. Okay. I'm so happy that everybody was able to make it out tonight. And I'm hoping that one of the things, well, I'm not saying hoping, let me just correct myself and say, I am delightful to be able to present this first piece of uh, work that some of us will, will speak to most of our experiences. And I think across institutional lines, you know, there's a documentary that I and others have worked on, some of which who are who are on this on uh, Zoom live, and you know, uh, that really addresses how we how we absorb institutional racism, the challenges we face. And so uh, I wanna first thank all the brothers and sisters that participated. Um, I selected out of those participations of 50, um, the five for just this educational clip in which a lot of the Emerson, Emerson students at the time helped me film. Um, and I wanna thank also Nate Kennedy for actually working to edit this film and, and bring it into the, fr the fruition of what it is today. And so without that, without further ado, I wanted to share my screen with you. The name of the documentary is called Behind the Wall, Facing Structural Racism. 
in Massachusetts prisons. Okay, let me make sure that I got y'all queued in. Okay, can y'all see y'all see my screen? Everyone can see my screen. Make this bigger. Okay. Mac, don't forget to share the, the, the audio. Pause it because we can't hear it. Okay, wait a minute. Audio in your share, screen. in your share screen settings under advanced, it's one of the options. Yeah, I was looking for that. Hold on one second. Stop sharing and just do it again for a second. Okay, here we go. Let me just back up a little bit. First time I ever saw a state prison in my life was as a result of being shot in the back by a white police officer. And then they charged me with assault and battery on him and gave me five years. At which point that I, I went to Concord in 1972, involved myself in activities between 1972 and 1975, I was involved in the Peaceful, Peaceful Movement Committee. And that was around the time when Commissioner Boone came in um, to try to um, right some of the wrongs that was going on in, in the system and bringing the perspective. And and he was a decent man, you know, um, he was a decent commissioner. When we were involved in our struggles and, you know, we got to the point that we had to shut down the joint and we were like, nothing is not, uh, nothing's going to rule until the commissioner comes in and we address our concerns to him. And he would come in and he would, he would address our, our concerns. But, you know, maybe before that, and beyond that, you know, it was their system. You know, it remains their system now. The irony of, of, of the prison system is that a lot of the, the white prisoners have relationship with the white guards because a lot of the white guards are from the same neighborhoods that they are from, you know. And so they'll come in and say, I was drinking with your pops last night. He told me to say, hey, do you, you know, that type of stuff. And of course, when they're, when they're in a bar drinking together, they always look out for my boy, man, you know, and that type of thing. And so they have their kind of relationships as a result of that, they get the best jobs in the joint. I came out of state being, when I was 17. The programs wasn't in place, nothing was, so it was more of the same thing. Where it's like, they, we wasn't allowed until people started, you know, the AAC and stuff like that. We started making our own programs. All right. Part of it, and I, already, I mentioned it before, was DDU, where it's like, it kind of took me away from the environment, from people. Listen, not everybody could, no matter what. I mean, you could say some, some people, oh, yeah, we love each other, this and that, but people just care. Everybody just want to be miserable. If, if they don't see a way out, they just want everybody to be there with them. It's crabbing the bell mentality. And I think that kind of reflected. My family started coming by, and they started, you know, I'm like, damn, somebody actually cared. I, I think, um... 
is it either Arab or, or Boil Down Supreme touched on it where he did something where, you know, he picked up a book and he was able to study, he was able to, you know, open his awareness. So at 19 years old, being thrown into MCI frame of the M was very scary. I felt like the, the moment I walked in, I was treated like an animal. Let me start off by saying I, the, the folks who, the other inmates, the other women who were in captivity, if it wasn't for them, I probably wouldn't have made it through because there was no rehabilitation. There was no like, okay, you're going to jail because we want to correct this wrong thing that you've done. Um, but there was no sign of correction when I got there, right? And so I met some folks, met some women who pretty much schooled me about why I shouldn't come back there because of what they were going through. Not necessarily don't come back because there's a life out there for you or don't come back because there's education, there's mental health supports, there's a lot of supports outside that can stop you from coming back in here. No one knew about that. I had a release date, but I also had a parole date. And I also had some stuff on the back end that would stop me from getting parole. But I had no clue that it was going to come up and they probably didn't either. Um, so I wasn't prepared for my parole date and I wasn't prepared to come home. So the way the programs was structured when I came upstate and probably throughout my sentence, if you had a large amount of time, you was placed at the, at the back of the list for school, for programs, anything. So with my sentence structure, I couldn't get into any programs, whether I wanted to, whether it was there. The people who came, I had 18 years. If someone came with 17 years, he jumped me in front of the line and all the way down to one, two years, I felt like prison is for the um, termers. They don't um, sentence you to life and say you to like county. They sentence you to big time and you go upstate. So I feel like that should be more structured for people who's going to be there for a long time. And those people shouldn't be placed on ice while all of the other people with less time is rolling in and out. And they're reaping all the benefits of bettering oneself. You're not prepared. Like the world's constantly changing. You know, nothing stays the same in five years. Five years, everything changes. Um, I served as a chaplain for the Department of Correction. Uh, I was the only nation this time chaplain that yeah. served in all of the state prisons uh, for 13 years. Born and raised in Boston, Roxbury. I'm uh, coming from, you know, the, the, the era of, of gang banging and when the violence was really, really at, at its highest peak here in Boston. I was a product of that. Uh, I was involved with one of the local gangs here before I was introduced to the teachings of the Honorable Elijah Muhammad through the Honorable Minister Louis Farrakhan. Because of my background and coming from where I was coming from, when I joined the Nation of Islam, I was recruited to to really just go back into the prisons and to, to testify to those that were still living the life, you know, as an example, and let them know that, that you can get out the life. You know, we represent a people who were brought over here and robbed of the knowledge of ourself. We were robbed of our names, our language, our culture, our religion. Those cultural events are very important. They're celebrating our history, celebrating our heritage. You know, first of all, they were always viewed with suspicion, like we were doing something underhanded. The men were will be um, strict searched, coming in and going out, but they will put barriers for us to even put the event on. Almost every event had to be rescheduled because we would submit the paperwork and they will find something wrong and, and they will wait to the last minute to approve it. 
and we're always fighting to to get what we needed and and i know that you know the brothers that i was serving you know they had a fight you know they had a fight because it was their rights that were being violated you know just for basic things you know i remember one of the issues which to this day the people don't know how disrespectful it could be i remember the lawsuit for the prayer rugs and for the halal meals so the brothers were were requesting to have prayer rugs which is part of our faith we make prayer five times a day muslims make prayer on a prayer rug and they denied they denied the brothers to have prayer rugs and so they had to go to court the courts decided to take the means of less restrict you know restriction so they would give them a a prayer towel because they said a rug was too thick they could hide a razor or something in the and you know they didn't want to give them a, a prayer towel a few years later they come out with a dog program right. where the inmates are training the dogs and guess what the dogs get the dogs get a mat so if you have the dog program you can have a nice mat for the dog to lay on People go to prison, not for punishment. They go as punishment. The sentence is the punishment. It is not corrections job to layer it on, be rude to your visitors in the trap, um, um, your phone prices. Um, it's not our job to layer punishment. Our job is supposed to be corrections and rehabilitation and reducing recidivism and keeping the public safe. Language. Language is a big problem. The way staff speak to inmates, not everyone. Some, some of that involves racial um, slurs. Uh, the same way, um, and we haven't talked about it, I would say the companion issue is the same way women are spoken to mm -hmm. by officers. Uh -huh. so some of that falls along uh, gender uh -huh. as well. Uh -huh. um, a double whammy if you're a black woman. But, so I think there are indicators around the language, you know, this whole notion of don't rat, uh -huh. um, it's hard to get at uh -huh. situations when there are no witnesses. It's the, he said, he said, she said, she said, or they all said, and they all said mm -hmm. to me, racial tension would surface in those one-on-one -on -one exchanges, even if say for example a dis disciplinary report were being written for legitimate reasons for legitimate reasons to then layer it with racial epithets oh. what are you doing you know and i've always said we're supposed to be the good guys we're supposed to be we're supposed to be leading by example okay. and theoretically that's the whole point of the correctional recovery academy you know a prime piece of programming in the doc is that there's, there are basic principles, and one of them is when you're doing cognitive behavioral work, you're supposed to lead by example. My God, if, if you're talking about, you know, racial equity, or should I say racial inequity, I can think of no other institution that is more racially unjust than the, the DOC in our prisons. But Senator Liz Miranda has filed a bill to create an independent uh, prison oversight agency. Uh, so that's something I, I support. Um, so I think there needs to be greater scrutiny of the DOC and just having a hearing, you know, in December where, you know, EOPS and DOC refused to attend, but those who did attend really shined a late light on the, uh, disparities and, and lack of transparency in the DOC and House of Corrections, you know, incarcerated people or their family members or formerly incarcerated people, you know, need to do more outreach to their state reps and state senators and tell their stories. I think, unfortunately, it's easy for most elected officials to say, okay, once someone is convicted of a crime, I'm not really interested to help them or to understand, you know, why that crime happened.
one thing I want to shout out is at the AACC and PLS because I didn't know how to write a bill when I first got here, but you have to have advocacy organizations that really push um, for the type of legislation that goes further. Because in all state legislatures, when they do a bill, they think they're done, right? And so if you let us do it, you would think that we've done criminal justice reform and we're done. And so each year I file a bunch of bills. This year I filed 75, and I would say a quarter of them are in the criminal legal system. Uh, bills, everything from juvenile justice to an ending solitary to ending life without parole. And then a bunch of bills that really came from community. And I, I call this community, they're people behind the wall, people who love people behind the wall, just really trying to be like, how do we make this system more just? And so I actually filed two bills and one of them is to create an inspector general for the DOC because we're supposed to be in charge as the legislature, but if we don't have someone being in oversight, I don't know if we're actually doing the best of jobs that we need to do. We did something around policing, doing something around the correctional system because the sheriffs and the correctional officers were not included in the police reform bill. It was a, in a legis legislative act called Chapter 777, which has never been repealed by the way and supposed to still be in effect. And chapter 777 was a reform bill. And the dictates were that the Department of Corrections was under a mandate to, to, to rehabilitate us. And the language in the bill even went as, went as far as to say, if the Department of Corrections failed to do that, then we had the right as prisoners to rehabilitate ourselves. Well, that gave birth to all of these self-help programs that you see in, in, in prisons now. And so out of that came Van Toon, the Peace of Movement Committee and, and various programs like that to, for, 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 for prisoners to address their own needs because the Department of Corrections wasn't interested in doing that. You know, um, that's not in the interest of their job security. But because of Chapter 777, they could be quell our efforts to rehabilitate ourselves for they allowed in these programs to exist in this day and time. They just simply know the chapter seven or seven, and, and you know, and in and, and the self programs that exist now are hollow. Second, um, has my has my screen stopped sharing? No, just press stop share. Okay, all right, here we go. And so, yeah, I was happy to share that with you. Um, and I wanted to also thank EPI, Emerson, all those folks who, um played a part in helping me gardener up the resources, especially Rashim, who advised, who was my advisor over the project. <clears throat> and one of the things that I wanted to kind of um, expound on just real quickly is that this, re this outlines generationally what we all know, those of us who've been incarcerated, the real life experience or the real life challenges that we face in enduring programming, right? Um, this is one of of at least a series of of uh, clips that will be released. There's going to be a three part um, documentary that's made of much fuller length that tells the story of John Boone and fleshes this story out a lot more. But this, you know, the purpose of this clip is really to kind of educate folks who are not really informed about what's happening in Massachusetts as it relates to our incarcerated community, and particularly. Um, the black and brown experience. 
The other thing I wanted to add is that we also, I, you know, I produced a report that accompanies this. Um, and that that report really is what I'm going to get into in a little bit while, but I wanted to kind of now take the take this moment to introduce our next speaker that will talk more about just what are the realities of these programs today. And so I wanted to invite uh, State Rep. Erica Idahoven to kind of um, speak to the issue. Okay, can you all hear me okay? All right, awesome. Yes. Thank you, Mac. Thank you, Latoya, and everyone at REICI and PLS. Um, it's really, um, and thank you for sharing the documentary, Mac. That is really exciting to, to finally see. Um, yeah, I mean, I'll just say this. So a lot of my work has been trying to fill in that role of what the legislature is supposed to do, which is on oversight of the DOC. And quite frankly, we're really the one of the very few bodies that are able to even have the power to do so. Um, and even with that, um, I'll just say even more recently, I have been there. The DOC has blatantly violated the law in front of me by either denying me entry into prisons um, or just violating the Criminal Justice Reform Act right before my eyes. Right. So um, I just I know in the documentary we, we had a piece around, you know, we're supposed to be setting the example. Right. We're supposed to be following the rules. Right. We're supposed to be showing um, and leading by example. And that's absolutely not the case. What I see over and over again is that these rules and these, you know, regulations, these laws are just blatantly violated. Um, even before. Right. One of the very few people who is able to hold the DOC accountable myself, they have no um, concern about doing that, which is just so telling to me about the, the culture in the department. Um, I will say, too, I wanted to say a few words, too, about the racial inequities and also with programming, because that's something I've been really trying to dig into. Um, and what I've found, I mean, repeatedly what incarcerated people tell me is that the programming has gotten so much worse over the decades. Um, and I actually uh, found after interviewing at six different facilities that the DOC blatantly misrepresents what programs are being provided uh, in their program description booklet. It is completely wrong. Um, I had actually a number of programs from particularly in Framingham where women said, I've been incarcerated here for 20 plus years. I've never heard of all of these programs, right? There's so many programs that they had never even heard of. So where are these coming from? Um, the second piece too is around the fact that they don't inform us uh, accurately how many people are actually enrolled in these programs. Um, and to just give you all a sense, you know, one of the things that I worked on was to just get that data. How many people have access to various programs that would help people with rehabilitation and reentry? And just to take like two examples with vocational and with higher education, um, we have under like about 90 something people out of 6,000 who are in enrolled in vocational classes right now. These are classes that DOC, we spend millions of dollars to provide. That's all they're able to do is 90 slots, 90 individuals. And with higher education, I mean, these, mind you, are programs that come at no cost to the state, right, are, you know, just a little under 100 are in degree programs and another, you know, 60 or so are in non-degree programs. Um, that's abysmal when you look at the 6,000 people who are incarcerated. What are there? What does that wait list look like, right? What are the other opportunities there? And the reality is there are none. And what I've seen over and over again, I like can't emphasize this enough about the the, the racism that is so blatant. Um, when incarcerated people or volunteers, and I mean, this includes, I would say even the higher education institutes, um, you know, we're providing or we're trying to provide this program for free by volunteering time or by incarcerated people organizing self-improvement groups, right? Such as like, um, you know, you see like the Black Latino Asian Cultural Coalition as one example, just, you know, formed at Shirley. Um, you see that also in Norfolk, you have the other cultural groups, but they just face barrier after barrier. And again, before my eyes, right, of rescheduling events, canceling events, uh, denying visitors from coming in. And that's actually where the really blatant uh, disregard, again, of my, the legislative statutory right for legislators to conduct oversight was violated, was me trying to attend a Black, Latino, Asian cultural coalitions meeting 
And the DOC said, you can't attend it. And I said, that's violating the law because I'm a legislator. And they said, we don't care. So that's, I mean, that's the reality of um, those barriers that particularly if black and brown and Asian people are trying to organize, um, you know, and to celebrate culture, to do these cultural events, you know, to do political education, that's considered, you know, I mean, that is something that they absolutely try to get in the way in all these small ways. It's kind of death of a thousand cuts. So, um, you know, I just want to like share that those are the real barriers that we're placing. And then that really plays into what I think that is underlying all of this, which is that this is about job security, right? This is about saving jobs. Because what we've seen in Massachusetts is that over 10 years, we've cut the prison population in half from 12,000 to 6,000. And yet the DOC budget keeps going up. And so how, how do you justify that? Well, what they do is they keep people in higher security, particularly by race, right? Because black and brown people are o overly represented in higher security settings. Um, and they don't, they deny black and brown people from being put into lower security, but they largely have to keep people in higher security, even if that's not where they should be, right? And that means that you have one in five people leaving the prison system from Sousa Baranowski, a maximum security prison. You are setting people up to fail. You're not stepping people down. You're not giving people work release. You're not allowing people to obtain programming that they would have access to if they were at a lower security. Um, and so that's where, you know, this whole piece around access to program and education ties into how it's not in the DOC's interest to do that when they are trying to preserve their jobs because it's far more expensive to keep people in a more restricted setting than it would be if we said, hey, you should be in a pre-release or frankly, I think they should be able to serve their time in the community. Um, but that would go against, right, the, the need for DOC to preserve itself and preserve the jobs that pay six figures um, to correction officers. So I want to tie all that together around, you know, programming, right, the, the racial component of it, as well as how that ties into this greater goal that I think we all have to work towards, which is decarceration. So um, I just wanted to, again, thank you all so much. Uh, appreciate everyone doing this and definitely please fight for um, and help us get this bill passed around the structural racism because the reality is we in the legislature, we've studied this problem and there is no data, even when they set up the commission. So it's about time that we actually have an actual oversight um, in addition to the legislature, but like actual oversight capacity um, and particularly around collecting data on, on racial inequities that are so apparent in the DOC. So thank you all so much. Mac, you're, uh, you're on mute. <laughs> thank you, Erica. At this time, I'm gonna share my screen as we go into the next portion um, let me know if my screen is sharing. Okay, it looks like it's sharing. And let's go. Well, let me get out of this. Uh-oh. -uh. Okay. Um, can everybody see that clearly? Can everybody hear me? Yes, yes, yes we can see it. Okay, all right, all right. All right, so this next portion is the result of the report that, um, that I've worked on for a little while. <clears throat> and I wanted to kind of like qualify with Erica with the brothers that was that we just saw and the sisters in, that we just saw in the documentary really structurally talked about was was really this prolonged or pro, what I would like describe this continued fight 
of whether Massachusetts prisons should serve as places of punishment or rehabilitation, right? And I and I think a large part of the problem has been is that there has been no historical context to really understand two things. One, the racial complexity in which Department of Correction has always discriminated against Black and Brown folks, going back since John Boone all the way up until the present. The other thing is that many of the legislators and many of us do not know the the, the real aim of what this um, 1972 correctional bill was supposed to do and all these things. So, and I wanted to kind of also topple the question on the whether legislators themselves can actually provide oversight in the way that they think that they meaningfully can. Because I think what, what my report and findings have found is that over the course of 30 something odd years, the, a number of these violations have occurred and, and it's done. And while a battle has ensued between the, the incarcerated community and the courts, legislators have been silent on in between that in in between those periods right and then and then when they finally was able to do something or decided to do something by way of reform they did not have the history so that history would have led them to actually do the thing that we're asking them to do today that's my fundamental belief right and so i wanted to just without further ado kind of address this and so I want to kind of say also that most of you who've been following along um, in my previous community events, I think I've already set the case about how we as an incarcerated community has been discriminated. And so I wanted to kind of expound on this and talk about just what the Department of Correction has done, right, to, to bring back or to draw back what the 1972 correctional reforms were supposed to do. So I want you with the month well, the next title of this is non-compliance with the 1972 Correctional Reform Act and under the EOP supervision. And the reason why I'm focusing on this, and I and I want you to look at how they stripped us using this general law 127, section 33, is because in reality, a lot of us kind of take that. EOPS, and that's the Office of uh, Public Safety, as being the adults in the room when we kind of appeal to their process and we say, but I I have a whole different view of this. And so um, I'm going to present that right now. So first, I think it's clear to get an understanding that when the passage of the 1972 Correctional Reform Act happened, they already, they already kind of answered the question. Massachusetts do not sentence people for the purposes of punishment, right? And in doing so and making that clear, they passed this law in 127 section 72, which requires that every, excuse me, that every person that's sentenced, regardless of race or religion or what have you, right, are to be treated and so I wanted you to read this so that you understand, so you can see it yourself. The superintendent of the institution under the supervision of the Department of Corrections shall treat the prisoners with the kindness which their obedience, industry, and good conduct merit. So the, the legislators already reinforced this. The section in which the Department of Correction has relied upon in great detail to kind of undermine later is this this portion. The superintendent of all institutions under the jurisdictions, and as you can see, necessarily means to be used to maintain order in the institutions under their supervision, enforce obedience, suppress insurrection, and prevent escapes, and for the purposes they may at times require the aid and utmost exertion of the officers of the institutions. Now, to give you the, the, the historical racial com, uh, uh, context, and this is not really often talked about, the idea in the, campaign, in the campaign to change the supervision from the, the DOC from Health and Human Services to what we see now under the EOPS, this is what they said at the time they passed this. And these were the arguments in which 
a lot of these officers were making at the time in the passage of this 1972 correctional reform, right? <clears throat> it really began with the hiring of Commissioner Boone and then the unprecedented walkout of the white officers who, who had that reaction. One, because Boone was, uh, uh, was black and two, he was from the South, which at that time back in the, in the 60s and the 70s were two kind of like deadly cocktails, right? And so they boycotted and this went out to the point that they even contested whether or not Boone had the authority to even become commissioner by petitioning the SJC. This is something that's like nobody's never even talked about, right? They went, they went all the way to the SJC to challenge whether or not he had at least five years of experience as an administrator when knowing he already had eight years as an administrator in the federal corrections, but just to disqualify in, it, in their attempt to try to disqualify him from the position. And when that did not work, and I want you to get to, in, in order to understand this, at the time when Boone took over, Massachusetts prisons was being ran just as they are right now. The way that the max is locked down and segregated by units is the way it was before the 1972 correctional reform. The, those reforms mandated that those prisons had to be open and programs and services had to be the mandate of its time. So Boone came in with that idea in, in implementing and opening up the prisons. And so as a result of this, this is what was said in response by the CO union at the time. They classified it as the reform is coddling prisoners and his open door policy as a rising tide of permissiveness. I mean, you can't make this up. His open door policy has an open facility that permitted media and outside prisoner reform groups access to prisons that the CO union said eroded and threatened security and control of the prisons. And so many of us don't know that a lot of a lot of media was allowed access in the time that Boone also became commissioner. And so a lot of the inside folks was allowed to not just talk to, to the media, but they was allowed to investigate for their own right to figure out what was being done or whether or not what was being said was actual in actuality rather than a political position by one side or another, right? But they can't, but this is what's, what is to me is one of the things that's most important. This campaign turned into a legislative initiative by the CO union and its umbrella organization, Massachusetts Penal Committee, to lobby Bill H3833. Bill H3833 sought to change DOC supervision from Health and Human Services to EOPS. The consensus of legislators and professionals that led to its defeat was that such change would reverse the 1972 Correctional Reform Act's in its implementation, implementation mandates. Now, before I get to that, I think I skipped the skipped the thing. I wanted you to understand this is what it looked like when the 1972 Correctional Reform Act was implemented under Boone and then his predecessor Frank Hall. I want you to see all the things that existed. I want you to see all the vocational stuff, the avocations that allowed men to make their own businesses while in and sell their merchandises to make a living and to provide for their families while there. This is how the visitation program operated. The emphasis was on family and reunification. You couldn't even lose your visits for anything that did, that had nothing to do with visits. If you got a regular disciplinary report for something else, you couldn't lose your visits for unrelated visit infraction. The implementation of the furloughs, which allow men to do jobs, housing, the maintenance of their families and maintain community ties, and even segregation itself ran differently. 
Here's all the things that existed. including the classification system, which really mandated a step-down process, meaning if you did A and B, you got C and D. And that's how a lot of the folks was ciphered down into pre-releases, minimums, pre-releases, and then outside um, housings, housing programs. And then the PRA allowed these folks, the PRA program activity releases, the they allowed folks to go out, get their license while they was at minimums and at pre-releases, go out and do other educational training while they was at minimums or pre-releases, right, to, that, that the institution themselves did not offer. And there was no limitation, of course, on phone access, outgoing mail, nothing. And in order to enforce this, they instituted an oversight committee made up of legislative civilians and, of course, health and human services to ensure programs and services were running uniformly at every facility. When Governor Weld came in, he radically changed in 1972. And, and of course, what did he do that by? He abdicated supervision authority to EOPS in 1990. Something that all legislators and everybody previously had said the run-up to this would undermine and cut the 1972 reforms. And so this is was the first thing Governor Weld did, former Governor Weld did. He dismantled the Oversight Committee in 1990. And then he officially ended the furlough programs. Even though they're still on the books, no one has been furloughed since. I want you to look at everything that you saw that they had. And then when he came in, everything that they took. This was all under EOPS. Even the visiting room. It don't went from 10 to five to three non-contacts when there were contacts. They put in a phone system that not just monitored and recorded, but restricted the outcome to 10 people. And then when you look at what they did <laughs> when it came to segregation, well, this was one of the big pet peeves and still an ongoing fight today. They created segregation to make it punitive by stripping all of the privileges which was afforded by statute and regulations. And he even transitioned, and this is interesting because at, at one time, deals, any chaplain volunteers could come in at any time and come through the facilities and, and basically minister, but they changed that under EOPS and then decidedly for a very long time, decided not to hire any black or brown re religious uh, uh, chaplains that catered to those black religious beliefs. And then at Walpole, the first thing they did was this, eliminated all the existing jobs except for the plate shop. So they, these are the jobs that was left over by the time most of the, the young brothers came in. And then they returned the institution back to segregated blocks by separating the wings.
I just want y'all to see how did we get here? Here was the conditions in the mediums, all the things they took out, some of which they still have on their books and say that they do, but they don't. Now, the interesting thing that's never really talked about is that since John Boone, every black or brown person, whether in prison garb or uniform, have experienced racial discrimination. I've seen this my person, my person, and I think many of us who've been behind the wall know this to be an absolute fact. And based on this unchecked racial tension since Boone, right, as more blacks were hired by the DOC in as we know, the tough on crime rhetoric increased in the, in the influx of black and brown bodies came into Massachusetts prisons. Well, this led to the hyper surveillance by their white counterparts and engaging in the very same conduct. And I'm talking about officers, right? For example, white officers talk to white inmates for extended periods of time without being questioned about the subject of the conversation. Whenever black officers do it, they were scrutinized for for the appearance of that something was wrong by the by the inner perimeter security officer, right? And not only that, what a lot of folks don't remember that in the early 1990s, going back, that there was a whole big thing about the discrimination raised by the black officers at the time, one of which was Morris Charlie. And he, and a, among a, another lady named Karen Polito appeared between the Massachusetts Legislative Affirmative Action Coalition at the State House to testify how the Department of Correction was dis would discriminate against them by giving them the worst types of jobs. But here's what this was his experience. He was 11 year old veteran of the DOC was punished after an altercation with a white guard who was not punished. The incident occurred when Charlie intervened to stop his supervisor's assault on a pregnant female coworker. The supervisor had torn a button off the woman's shirt. The supervisor's elbowed Charlie in the throat before Charlie struck back, hitting the supervisor twice. Charlie testified that the woman and two white correctional officers who were present corroborated his version of events. None, nevertheless, Charlie was found guilty. Testifying at the public hearing on the sentencing of discrimination in 1979, Boone acknowledged that black prisoners served more time than whites for the same offense in Massachusetts. Black prisoners get maximum security while whites get into rehabilitative programs. Boone further testified about an inmate incarcerated at Massachusetts Correctional Institution in Concord who has become addicted to drugs after being pushed to use them by prison staffers. I saw it when it when I was there, you can't have a drug ring going on anywhere without those in government knowing it's going on, winking at it and letting it go. Now, here's the interesting thing. <clears throat> Boone's observations as commissioner still rings true today, as I've been setting the case going through Worcester, Boston and out in Springfield, showing folks about how they do the incarcerated black and brown folks. But it also rang true for those black and brown officers who are really relegated to work in the 11 to 11 to 7 shift just to escape the racial discrimination stuff that happens on the day to day basis. Now, I wanted to kind of just shift gears into the non compliance aspect of it because, you know, some of the legislators have said this, and I wanted to kind of get this understanding that here's what segregation has always meant in Massachusetts by legislators. Segregation shall not be used as a form of punishment, isolation, and cannot exceed 15 days. The prohibition was passed in 1955 under the general laws in the, uh, of Massachusetts section 39, which was expanded in 1972 to include programs, mental health and services, right? So this is something that's been a well stone. The Department of Correction basically regulated through the Administrative Procedure Act, the 421s, which required them to hold a certain level. 
yet what the department started doing early on in from the 80s leading up to the 90s was they learned to switch the names of the units. And as long as they switch the names of the unit, they figured they can still enact the same punitive and maintain the same practices and then force us to have to fight and litigate those those units to, as being one of the same as punishment units, right? And so Longville established this practice. It recognized that the department was sidestepped statutory and regulatory provisions stating that the rights of an inmate as to placement in a DSU by signing as a pretext another name to such a unit. Well, this became a full-blown tactic used in the, under the Wells administration. And this is why I really call this a rose by any other name would still smell as sweet, right? Because in applying this, they would rely on 127 section 33. Now I wanna show you kind of a, an example of this. Um, and, and a lot of oh, this happened while the legislators were in, enacted also. So I just wanna make that clear that the DSU was litigated for years under a, a case called Carl Hoffer, right? Versus the Department of Correction. And it fought for what a humane, humane living conditions in which it won in accordance to what the statute mandated. And so they was the, they was informed to build a new unit. This unit that I'm talking about is right here called DSU, Project 86-459. When Larry Dubois, who was appointed by, who was appointed by governor, former Governor Weld as commissioner, when he came in, he was, of course, from the federal system, and he had worked at Marion uh, for a Marion prison, which is a segregated uh, prison that houses uh, the, the, supposed to be the worst of the worst. Well, what he decided to do was make this new unit, DSU, into a punishment unit, and he called it the Department of Disciplinary Unit. Now, this was in direct conflict of Massachusetts segregational statutes, right? Yet... The Massachusetts legislative body was silent about the money allocated to construct the DSU facility and the repurposing of it. And it wasn't until recently, I mean, when I say recently, I'm talking about within the last year, had they decided to close, technically close DDU down and not because it violated the law, right? Because, because they're saying, well, we're trying to move beyond restrictive confinement. At least that's what they said, can, you know, that's what they say on their face. The climate that preceded Governor Wells' designation of the DOC supervision to EOPS occurred under a racially charged rhetoric of Massachusetts being soft on crime that derived from the 19, the, the 1988, 89, excuse me, Dukakis and Bush presidential campaign, which elevated Willie Horton as the escape and assault. Now, I don't need to go into the racial complexities of all that. I think that most of us is, is kind of astute about why that happened. But what I wanted to show is how Du Bois eviscerated the segregational statuses, not just by changing the DDU, DSU into DDU, but he also then took the administrative process and started reinterpreting the 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 regulations called 423s, which govern segregation when you're being held just for non-disciplinary, right? If you're you're just being there waiting action and you you haven't been found guilty of anything, or if you're there until they decide to figure out what you need to be what needs to be done, or if let's say protective custody purposes, right? You 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 can't be in a in a facility and you uh, segregated on that purpose. Well, what he decided to do was make every unit punitive by stripping them of their of their uh, their regulatory and their segregational uh, statute rights by de denying them access to TVs, only providing them with the radios, depriving them of any ability to have canteen, depriving them of any meaningful recreation except for the one hour in the dog kennel cages, all that. This, this is what he decided to do. And it wasn't until Robert Foxworth successfully challenged the policy that 
said that, hey, the, the statute mandated this, the regulations also affirms this, and we want we want the TVs and everything else that we're supposed to have. Well, the DOC's response was they went back and removed the TVs and everything else out of the regular out of the regulations after the court ruled favorably for them. But Du Bois didn't stop there. He also re actually returned. He actually returned DDU. I mean, excuse me. Walpole back to its segregational status by creating the East and West Wings and creating this three-phase unit block, which means that down in the minimum end, everyone was out with regular privileges, but down on the max end, everyone was locked into these little units in which they had to earn their way through. And if, if not, you could be in those blocks forever, right? Of course, this... This violated the 421s, which required anyone put under those types of conditions to be given a minimum due process, a hearing to contest their ability to be put in those units, which was in, which was ultimately ruled on. But while this battle ensued for several years until the Supreme Judicial Court determined Havity on October 10, 2002, the legislator's oversight of the DOC was silent on the misuse of segregation status and segregation units in those that operated in general population. Now, when you look at what has been happening, and I and I say this, and I and I don't mean no disrespect to any of the legislators, because I think that in their mind, when they passed the 2018 Criminal Justice Reform Act, it was really a good passage. I, you know, I stand by that. I think it was, but it was a reduplication of what they already had passed in the 1972 Correctional Reform, which allowed these very same things to already exist. And so, what we was looking at was a lack of enforcement and how to get the department not to look at the punitive rehabilitation through a punitive lens, but how to get them to look at um, rehabilitation through the expansive lens in which it was designed under its original context. And because of that, with the CJR, and one of the things that I wanted to focus on, define, started to define what restrictive housing looked like. So anything 22 hours or more were considered restrictive units, and you can find that under the statute in which I, in which I present. But it also outlined uh, these other things that they say that they want: out of cell, uh, make sure that there's programs and services, all these things. And yet, as we can see. As we can see, the fight has continued because the Department of Correction has denied all these things to the prison, to the incarcerated community, even today, as we speak. They don't have access to their TVs. They renamed the unit by creating what they call the SAU to undermine having to give them the those those benefits, those entitlements, and what the legislators doing. And even though that this is going on technically under the nose of the legislators, well, the Department of Correction has says, well, because we're 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 considering recreation to be when we take them out of the cell and chain them to the table as part of recreation, they fall under 22 hours. So because they fall under 22 hours, we no longer technically run restrictive housing units. And so this is the name of the game in which they 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 decided to play in order to sidestep. And this is just reiteration of what I just explained. Now, I wanted to kind of just for wrap this up by talking about the, this latest article in which the part which the correctional officers came out with about them not feeling safe, the attacks on correctional officers. And I think everyone knows that when you have punitive conditions and you treat people inhumane, that and a lot 
of that has been the case, what ends up happening is it sparks and it breeds violence, right? <clears throat> but I want you to focus on what did, what did they claim was responsible for that? The rise in the number of assaults come five years after the state's sweeping criminal justice reform aimed at providing rehabilitation for inmates and lowering the incarceration rates. Now, this is interesting. I, I want to show you something. This was Makufu, the, the officer's union response to the enforcement of the Hoshberg, Hoshberger reforms. Mr. Kennaway also dismisses a key commission recommendation that the commission is proud to have accomplished rewriting the Department of Corrections mission and vision statements to reflect an emphasis on reducing recidivism through humane confinement and successful community reentry of our offender population. This is what Kennaway said. It's a bunch of words. It's a regurgitation of a touchy feeling stuff, Mr. Kennaway said. As far as we're concerned, this rehabilitation approach is an old policy that was first tried in the 1970s and didn't work then. So we went to incarceration in the 1980s. Now we're going back to the old ways. You, you can't make this up. <laughs> like, and then this is what they're saying today about the previous. And when I say they, I'm talking about the Correctional Officers Union, Makufu. He said, this and other tragic officers' assaults are a direct result of more relaxed rules and regulations mandated by the Criminal Justice Reform Act legislation. This legislation grants inmates more rights, freedom, housing, and tier time. This has allowed inmates to manipulate the system and engage in violent actions, increase gang activity, intimidation, and assaults on officers and other inmates. Now, I just wanted to bring this up to say that these are the same old playbook tactics in which the union and administrators have used in order to try to maintain the lockdown status and the restrictive punitive use of segregation and as well as to deny or continue the status quo as we know it today, right? Because in to actually implement the reforms, to actually to give men and women what they're entitled to would then not only re lower recidivism rate, well, it wouldn't justify the enormous budget in which the Department of Correction continuously increases every single year. And so what we're talking about here is really high level politics, right? High level politics that's being played for job security, nothing more, nothing less. And what's not talked about, especially in the article in which, in which just recently came out, uh, is that the officer himself who was injured, and I don't, you know, I don't condone any officer being harmed, but the fact of the matter is, is that this officer was walking around calling folks the N-word. He was antagonizing. Many complaints was written about him. And the management refused to move him out and discipline him accordingly. And as a result, this thing occurred, which anyone would tell you after serving time and seeing officers like him, it's just a matter of time, right? So they do this and they know this because it creates this narrative for them to then come out and politicize the issue in hopes that they can maintain the status quo and keep from happening with, with all the enforcement of the 1972 correctional reforms as they should be. And with that, I just want to turn over to you guys. Um, any questions about anything we said, anything, you comments, thoughts on the documentary or what have you, I wanted to turn it over to those of you that's been in, in attendance. Thank you. Any thoughts, comments? Yeah, I'd well, like to say I'll speak. Um, yeah, go ahead, go ahead. Definitely. Uh, this is Minister Randy Muhammad, um, Minister Muhammad Moss, number 11. Um, so awesome job, brother. I uh, just want to let you know uh, the report, uh, the documentary was very powerful. Um, 
it's just so great to finally see it. I remember um, when you was working to put it together. I think that the report that you get, just gave us after the viewing was um, even more powerful, you know, and uh, so continue the good work. And I, I think that even all that information that you just shared should be a part of of the documentary, you know, uh, all the clips and everybody else speaking. Uh, maybe you should do a broader a video that that includes you wrapping it up with with that presentation because that was very very powerful and um we need to get i can't wait till it is really all the way out um because um i would like to you know have many more screenings we got we have to bring uh that information to as many audiences as possible and i believe that um the manner in which it was done that uh, a lot of folks will be very interested because it's easily digestible. So great job. Thank you. Cordell? Mike, yeah. Hey, you did a good job, man. Um, you know, yeah, it was it was crazy. Uh, the last, uh, I did 12 and a half years and in the last 18 months that I was in, um, I, I wrapped up from Concord Farm. And, you know, you had white guys there, I believe lifers that were able to go out in the community and work. I wasn't even serving a life sentence and they wouldn't let me go out at all. So after 12 and a half years, I wrapped up with $1,200 to my name, married, uh, and at that time with three children, now I have four. So uh, yeah, like you said, man, it, they're setting us up for failure. Mm -hmm. Absolutely, absolutely. Any other comments, thoughts? Yeah. Oh yeah. Um, just to piggyback off of um, Mr. Randy, um, the, the same thing. I think that that was a powerful thing. The the whole wrapping it up because I think everything is semantics. Where it's like, oh, by the name, by by the way, my name is Jonathan. <laughs> just, just just in case. Um, I think the semantics people try to play with it, and I think you breaking it down and, and showing what actually is allowed. What what they what are they using? I think that's a big thing for people out there in the community that haven't been locked up and don't know what the conditions are or the things that are happening. So I think that's a big part where you can bring a lot of people more in by you breaking down that presentation you did because it, it was easy to understand and how to, you know, to, to basically know what they're doing and how they're using it to their advantage. Thank you for the good work, bro. Thanks. Hi, my name is Noemi. I'm in Springfield and, um, I wanted to say thank you also. I'm really grateful for the information. I've been for a couple of years, I have been involved with different groups that do criminal justice reform, but I this is something that I didn't know, to be honest. And um, I'm hoping that there's a way that we can share that, that that information can be shared. Um, I work with Neighbor to Neighbor and we have a group that focuses on criminal justice and we try to get involved with the different laws that are being legislated on. So. Um, I mean, and I really am very thankful um, for the work that you're doing. Uh, very thank you. Hi, this is Lorraine, folks, Matt Hudson's stepmother. I'm so proud of what you have done and what you're doing now to promote and help people to understand exactly what's going on because it's been going on for too long. And I'm still angry over the fact that Commissioner Michi gets to dance off into the sunset and with her with her retirement and unscathed um, politically and her name is, you know, still pure as the driven snow. Mm -hmm. And she oversaw all of this stuff for the mm -hmm. past, I don't know how many years. She made her way up the ladder by playing the game and turning her a deaf ear and blind eye to all of what was going on against the 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 prisoners mm -hmm. and it just it's it's it sickens me that this is still continuing and i go back to what minister randy was saying how they treated him how they treated you all as i was um an outside liaison, mm -hmm. liaison to help bring the guests in to, and mm -hmm. they were invited to these events and they were they were treated poorly when they were able to get in because mm. a lot of times, as you said, you send them the, the, the proposal, they wait 30 days to look at it, 
to accept it, then they wait 30 days to tell you that it's too late and you know you should have turned it in earlier. And that went on for years. Every event, the uh, all of the events regarding people of color and Latin people of color, Latin everybody, everybody. So now I, I would really like to see, and I will help promote <laughs> the recruitment of people to understand, to, to see what it is that you all have put together. Toya Whiteside, I commend you. Mac Hudson, I commend you. I salute all of y'all. You mm -hmm. survived it and um, are even talking about the injustice to the guards of color, to the prison guards of color. I, 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 my mouth is dropped open. <laughs> I'm so glad that this is all together in one place. The laws have been outlined from the beginning, 1972 on down, the violations, the attempts to overturn them, the unsuccessful attempts to overturn them, but to circumvent and go around them and to create fictitious codes that that should not be allowed, but that are because most of the taxpayers don't know what's going on. This mm -hmm. impacts taxpayers, not just taxpayers and families, most of all families, but taxpayers are paying. So I commend you and I will help you all in any way I can. Thank you, Mama Ray. You're welcome. Hello, everyone. I'm Nigel. Um, Mac, you already know what we've been through. We've been through the line, man. He's my big brother. He gave me a lot of guidance with learning the law and specifically how to challenge them and hold them accountable. This DOC doesn't really get held accountable and you know, a lot of us who've been through a lot of that struggling, we would like to see, you know, them be held accountable, like with letting the legislators in and they know they're supposed to like, if it's break, if it's going down to that point, like there's a real, a real, you know, need for um some checks and balances there. So I would just say um you know try to support that cause whenever there is that cause to everyone and um again i appreciate you mac man keep doing your thing keep teaching we appreciate you yes sir hey cousin mac how you doing man <laughs> okay now cuz yeah i how want you? you to know i'm doing all right i want you to know that uh I'm proud of you, man. Proud to have you as a family member, man. And I want you to know it's been wonderful watching you in your uh, transition. I know the people of, people of color are up there, and they're glad to have you as their, as their voice and stuff. You know what I mean? I just want you to know, just keep doing what you're doing, man. And I'm watching you, man. And I'm going to support you yeah. in any, any way you need me to, man. All right. Hey, Mac, how you doing? Okay, I see, uh, I hear one other person trying to speak and I see two other hands. Uh, we're gonna uh, take this these last three comments and then we'll we'll do our call to action. Mm -hmm. uh, hey, hi, how are you? Um, good job, Mac, uh, it's Jabari. Um, yeah, I think that it was, it was a very good video and uh, me being someone who's just been out for six months, uh, it's super relevant. Um, this last conviction was for an assault on a correction officer that happened in a county jail. Mm -hmm. But due to the conviction, I was housed in Shirley Maximum Security. And this was my third state bid, and I had never been in maximum security. Um, during the incarceration at the DOC, I never had an infraction. I never had a write-up. I completed every single program that the prison allowed with the exception of two because they said that I didn't warrant the two. I was never leveled down. I was considered level A. So I was told that I had to stay there for the duration of my incarceration, even though I was a model inmate by their standards, you know, um, no informal write-ups or anything. So it didn't allow me to go to a minimum. It didn't allow me to, um, you know, go to a job. Uh, I used the programs that I did go to, you know, as um, substance and you know what I'm saying, to help gain any kind of um, leverage that I could in order to, you know, make the transition back into the world easier. Credible Messenger was very good. Um, 
they did uh, do a lot of help for me. But they only allow that when you're six months to the door. Um, uh, I was allowed to go down to the the, the lowest level in Shirley Max, and that's at 18 months to the door. Um, I think it's very relevant to be said that um, there's another war going on inside the walls right now. I've never, and I've done three state bids 14 years in total, I've never seen drugs pushed like the MAP program is pushing drugs in that prison with no oversight. I was constantly asked by staff, hey, do you want to get on the MAP program? Do you want to do the MAP program? Do you want to do the Suboxone program? Do you want to do the methadone? I said, I have no drug history in my, in, in my folder at all. Why do you keep on asking me this? In 2015, when I left, they were pushing Vivitrol, which was an opium blocker. I never heard Vivitrol mentioned one time during this incarceration. It was all, and I and I used to keep track of how many of us on the unit were sober. So out of 180, even though they were splitting the units, the highest number that I kept track of was three, me include me being one included. So so so, I'm watching younger guys come in with no addiction leaving out now with an addiction. So they're, they're, I, I would like to know where's the recidiv recidivism rate on that? And how are you doing this with no oversight? How are you justifying giving this man, even guys who had been down 20 plus years, how do you just allow them to say, yeah, I wanna go on map and you, and you say, yeah, no problem, but he's been here 20 years. So even if he did have an opium habit, hasn't he not had one for 20 years? Right. And, and, you know, and, and then if you go to the line, to get the map um and you know you cheat your meds or whatever or you have some form of infraction of not you know you know doing what you need to do in proper procedure mm -hmm. there was no there was no there was no punishment for that but you'll throw a brother in the hole for hanging a clothesline through a cell you get what i so i just think that that's you know it, it, it's deeper um mm -hmm. you know i'm enrolled mm -hmm. at kneecap so i'm in school on mass and cast every day to me, mass and cast looks like the outside life that's going on inside the prison. Mm -hmm. And, um, you know, uh, wish me luck, um, Matt, because I did put my background check in today to be allowed to go into um, Middlesex House of Correction. Mm -hmm. So, you know, yes. when I was at the state. I was at the state house Monday um, and we did secure two hundred thousand for post incarceration. Uh, so hopefully you know, the wheels are turned and, you know, we'll keep fighting a good fight, but I appreciate what you're doing, brother. Absolutely. Latoya, you said there was Mary. two more hands? Okay. Yes, Mary and Manny. Hi, uh, my name is Mary Valerio and I work with a group called the Actual Justice Task Team. And one of the areas that I was particularly interested in was education and programming within the prisons. I think you did a marvelous job here showing not only the deficiencies in those areas, but the deficiencies regarding race and other topics as well. <clears throat> because I did a couple of freedom of information requests on DOC about three years ago. And at that time with, short, with about 6,000 people incarcerated, there were 4,000 on waiting lists. Oh, that in, It's almost unbelievable. And with the budget this year that had come out last summer, the DLC is getting approximately 130000 for each and every incarcerated person. So I said, well, if you've got approximately 6,000 people in prison and close to 3,000 corrections officers, the corrections officers outnumber teachers 100 to 1 in this state. Oh. So you can see where they're putting the money, where they're putting the effort. So you did a really great job on this. I hope you can share it with a lot of people because this is something that I and another group have been working on as well because it's a disgrace the way they treat people. To be honest, it's a disgrace. Mm -hmm. So thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you for being here. Mm -hmm. Good, evening. Good evening, everyone. Uh, what's going on, Brother Mac? Uh, I'll, I'll get on. I'll get on camera for like two seconds, but I, I just uh, again just a couple of things that I I wanted to really emphasize and point 
and, and direct folks to um, number one is um, Jabari. Uh, welcome home, brother. Appreciate you um, and everything that y'all are doing. But a couple of things I want to say is that uh, that was a great, great presentation, brother. I appreciate you. You know, since day one, how I um, just just gravitated to you and, and what you're putting out there, um, even inside the walls, how, how folks gravitated to you. So this is no surprise to me um that that this is this is happening and and you're taking your your rightful spot as a leader in the community so definitely want to appreciate you for that um number two is the documentary um truly truly um inspirational and, and very thoughtful in how you all did it um would love to have that and present that to other folks across mm -hmm. once it's done because again oh. I, I think it's it's truly truly powerful and, and, okay. and really breaks down what folks need to hear um, cool. moving forward, right? Um, just from that particular document, um, even if folks haven't been incarcerated, we'll look at that and be like, oh, okay, this is what what is integral and what's really, what, what it means, right, in a sense. Um, the, the next thing is um, I, I definitely want to point out program monies is something that I, I believe you all touched on briefly. But that is a huge, huge piece that I think is happening in the DOC. And I've had it brought to my attention a couple of times is there's a ton of money going into the DOCs, but nobody seemed to know what programs are being offered and what's yeah. what's going on. Right. Well, so it, I mean, it, to me, that that just baffles my mind that this is an yeah. ongoing issue if folks really know about it. Right. So well, we need to really dive, dive deeper into that, mm -hmm. that type of stuff. Um, two more points. Sorry, I'm speaking long winded, but uh, the oversight committee um, and I know this has been talked about in previous um, engagements that you have done. Um, whatever I can help with when it comes to that, if if need be, then please direct me in the correct way so I can oh. try to be as, as as a part of that as I can be as well. Um, oh. And lastly is the integrity to what you do. Right. I, I think that needs to be forefront and a lot of things that 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 people go to i know me and you spoke briefly on a lot of things that are happening out here that oh. that a lot of folks are, are gravitating to but doesn't have the integrity behind it right oh. so a lot of folks that are here that that do, do and does this work um i think it's, it's really powerful i see a lot of familiar faces here which I'm super excited about because I understand their integrity to the work. So that's oh. the main piece that I would always end with is, is keeping that work in front of you. And you've always done that, at least in my eyes. So I um, definitely want to show you some love and, and everyone that's here as well. So thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Appreciate it. Um, so I, I want to thank everybody for their comments. And I want to also bring Amanda back so that she could, you know, pick up where she left off early on with the call to action and some of the things that we will be asking of you as we start thinking in terms of coalition building. So oh, with, that, with that, with that, with that said, okay. Yeah, yeah, we, we can hear you. All right, all right, listen, I ain't that smart as all of you all, but I'm his day one friend, yo, bro. I'm so proud of you, bro, bro. I wish I would have gave my son this link, you know, because I'm 50 plus. I ain't got no infractions, but you did give a lot of powerful information, brother. I love you, the family, you know, you know, how we go back and everything. Everybody up here, I love y'all. I'm still learning and we out here. We good? <laughs> y'all can hear me? We, yeah, all right, we can right, hear right. you. We can hear you. feel special. All right, all right, all right. <laughs> Everybody, yo, if y'all ever see me in the streets, Yo, I love y'all, man. Just listen, yo, we out here. This is my day one friend. Yo, M, brother, I love you, man. And listen, I'm trying to get him to run for mayor, y'all. We need to get him behind. Yeah, yeah, we're going to get woo up. Out. Is that wrong to say? Don't let me mess up. You know I don't know no better, bro. Don't let me mess up. No listen, 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 listen. All right, bro, listen. Thanks for the love and support. Thanks for the love. Vote Matt Hudson. Okay, Amanda. <laughs> In that celebratory spirit, I want to I encourage everyone to 
give more love to Max, show your appreciation in the chat with emojis, move your body. We've been sitting a long time. We're close to closing us out. Um, but I just, I want to bring us back to this bill because, oh yeah, this bill, this is going to be a thing that we can all work on together now to help uh, bring uh, oversight of jails, prisons, and the DOC to, to, to help move this into law. Um, so I'm going to ask a couple things of us tonight. Um, the first thing is that uh, I'm just going to information share um, with two actions. I'm, I've just popped into a chat, into the chat, um, a toolkit. And this is um, going to give you uh, two specific things that you can do over the next couple days. Um, the first one is please make calls. If you haven't made calls yet for this bill, please do. Um, so first, just a reminder about where uh, the Senate Bill S-1545 is, is that right now it's in um, the Joint Public Safety and Homeland Security Committee that is chaired by Walter Timulty, whose districts are where many of us live, which is uh, Norfolk, um, Plymouth, and Bristol counties. So um, please call Walter Timulty. On this toolkit, um, you will see that the, the first link on it is a, a call script. You're welcome to use that call script. You can also just speak from the heart and, and tell him, tell uh, his director, the legislation, his aides, why this bill matters to you. So you can use that, uh, that call script that's in this toolkit. Um, if Timothy isn't your senator, please also call your own senator. There's a link of how to find your senator if you don't know who that is. Um, oh, sure. Yeah, I'll, I'll, I'll share my screen. Um, you know, I don't have it open yet. Let me, um, let's see. Okay. You're about to see a messy screen. Okay. Okay. Yeah. So when you open this toolkit, you'll see that the first, the first link is the call script, the first, first book bookmark. And um, we're asking that you call Timulty and you also call your own senator if it's not Timulty um, to, and ask your senator to bug him and to get this bill voted out of committee by uh, April 8th. That is our deadline. And so it has to happen by now for this bill to have a chance during this session. Um, the second ask is this. So already I've heard some of you name uh, organizations that, that you're representing tonight. Awesome. We're asking you to join a sign, an organizational community sign-on letter um, that's going to have a bunch of names of organizations on it that we're going to send to Chair Timulty. So if, if you are part of an organization, um, whether that's a nonprofit or maybe even a for-profit entity that's concerned with social impact, and you would like to join this sign-on letter, uh, you can do that by emailing me and letting me know how you want your organizational name to appear. You can also share a logo if you wish. Um, so you can, uh, the, the bookmark uh, to the organi organizational sign-on letter um, will show you that letter, but um, really I'm asking you then to reach out to me and my email is right here um, so that you can let me know about how your organizational name should appear and, and if you wanna share your logo as well. Finally, maybe you're here tonight and you're like, I don't belong to an organization. Oh, but I'm thinking of this community center down the way. I'm thinking of this political action group. They should sign on to this. So I'm inviting you to um, share, write them an outreach message. Um, you're welcome just to bring their name to my attention. I can reach out to them uh, on your behalf, but I also invite you just to reach out to them yourself. Um, and there's a sample uh, message here that you can use in the toolkit for doing that. Um, you never have to use any language that's on this toolkit. You can use your own language, but this is just a way to make it sort of uh, fast and easy for you. Uh, okay, uh, so those two asks are make calls and um, join our org organizational sign-on uh, if you're an organization or if you want to bring an organization to our attention, and you can email me about that. Um, any questions about that before I move on to the last thing that we're all going to do together? No? Okay, awesome. So the last thing is that um, while we're all in this room together, I'm going to invite us all to write an email to Timothy. So we also have language for this. I see a question in the chat. I'm going to pause. There's no question in the chat. Okay. If you want to uh, so share the language the for the email. Once more, so it's accessible. Thanks. Um, so the the last thing is for us to write an email to Timothy all together. So I'm going to start by um, I'm going to drop the actual 
text of that into the chat for those who have trouble with Google Docs. But if you don't have trouble with Google Docs, you can find the language for this email and the uh, Timulty's email and his legislative director. Um, and we're asking you to CC. Um, oh, I direct, I direct messaged Latoya. Okay. Sorry about that. I got it, Amanda. Don't worry. Okay, great. Thank you. Um, uh, okay, so let me see. Um, oh yeah, so let me screen share again, and I will also drop all the text of the email into the chat. So for anyone asking for the information in the chat, um, again, that's something that we're going to send out a large email blast to everyone who registered everyone who participated um, in the event tonight. So if you did not register and you are present and would like to receive this information, please pop your information into the chat so we can make sure that we include you on the email list. And what Amanda has posted in, a, in the chat presently is the language of the email that we would like you all to send tonight before we log off. And that's yeah. just an email, again, going directly to Timothy's office. Yes. asking for support of, of S 1545. That's right. And so I'm copying and pasting the last of this email into the chat. So if you have trouble with that uh, Google Doc, you can just copy and paste it here. And while we take action together, I'm going to turn on a little music. Does anybody have any questions about sending the email out now? No, and I see we have one more email address. So uh, Kelsey or Ariana, if you could please add that to our list. Mark yeah, Lawrence. I'm having difficulty. Cordell, you said you're having difficulties copying the information? Uh, yes, yes. If you pop your um, email into the chat, we can we can email it to you really quickly. Okay. All right. And uh, Amanda, before you start the music, hold on. Yes. Let's uh, let's get Cordell's email address. Definitely. Um, Ariana, if you can email um, that language, or um, Amanda, can you email that language to Cordell since you have it? I sure it? can. Yeah. Mac, you're on mute. Um, we also have a note in the chat that part of the email is missing from the chat. I will add that now as well. So beware, there's one more portion of the email to be added. Thank you. The last and paragraph. There's Thank another you, chat Wilson. comment in there also. Is an email campaign like an action network? So we do have um, an email campaign, but the problem with that campaign is that uh, the the call to action goes to the legislator that's in the individual's jurisdiction. So it asks for you to put your home address into um, the initial information, and then the email will go to that specific legislator. So that's why we're doing this separate email asking you to send it directly to Timothy's office, since ultimately he's the one who will make the deter the decision as to whether or not the bill is voted favorably out of committee. So, so are you saying I can wait until we close out and then go into the email and do it from there? Yes, you can. Okay. We're All just right. trying to give everybody an opportunity while we have the momentum to, to send it now. Okay. Yeah. And I'm going to, I'm sending Cordell and one person who emailed, who popped their email in the chat prior an email right now. Okay. So, so if everyone can put a thumbs up, if you're either going to send it after the meeting, although we would prefer you to do it now, or if you have already sent it, um, there's a little reaction. Uh, I've I seen one thumb, but if you can do the reaction so we'll know who who's done. Oops, Cordell has his Mary Christine. Manny, I got you too. Okay.
Okay. Okay, Mac, if you uh, want to just give folks uh, some last information about our next um, e uh, our next event, we plan to send out an email, not sure of the date as of yet, but uh, we'll certainly keep you posted um, as to what happens with um, the bill going, making it out of committee. Um, even if it doesn't, we want to still continue the fight, continue to push. So um, we've, we've learned a lot of lessons along this journey. Um, so we certainly want to keep the momentum and implement those lessons, um, no matter how the bill fares. It's something that we will continue to push um, for sessions or years to come if need be. Yeah, Thank so you. I would, yeah, so I would just add in, in concluding that, um, thank everybody for coming and for being a part of the movement and we 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 intend to make sure that um our voice is heard and for us the next natural step is for us to start thinking about us figuring out a time where we can all just show up at the state house you know yeah. i think that is the natural result um we've had over 119 people who actually register for this event half half showed up for it. So I think that's a good sign. Um, and, uh, and, and so I think moving forward, we want to definitely make our voices heard, right? Um, and let folks know that this is, this is necessary. And so they will be showcasing of the documentary in different community settings. Um, and we'll, we'll reach out to everyone and let them know where that's going to take place when and where that's going to take place as we figure out what's the next step. As soon as we learn whether or not it's voting out of committee or not, if it is voted out of committee, the real campaign really starts at that moment and we will need more of you to join us in our coalition. So next month we will be having a coalition meeting. Um, that meeting will be asking folks to come on, you know, after hearing everything we've heard and experiencing what we experienced as a result, we will ask for community partners to come in as coalition uh, uh, building, right? And figuring out what we need to do as, an, as next steps. So with that, good night, everybody. Thank you for coming and I'll see you. Peace.